So next, we're going to transition to our next speaker, whose name is Demir Spurton. He's a senior software engineer at Netflix. And so welcome to the stage. Hi, thank you. Hi, thank you. How's it going? It's going well. So we're so happy to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Should I be able to start? I believe so. Your slides are up. It's looking great. Feel free to start whenever. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for listening to my talk. I'm super glad I could present to you all today. I'm sad that we're not all together at a nice location like New York, where we could all meet up and hang out. But at the same time, it's great that we could join all join this conference from across the globe. Let me introduce myself. My name is Damir Svartan. My pronouns are he, him, and I work as a senior software engineer at Netflix. I'm based in San Francisco, and that's where I moved about three years ago. Prior to moving to San Francisco, I used to live in Zagreb, the capital city of Croatia, a small country in Southeastern Europe, and that's where I grew up and spent the first 28 years of my life. Now, designing APIs and less data is more. Why is this topic relevant to me? Well, I've been building APIs for the last seven years, and I've seen a pattern where developers like to expose more data than is actually needed. I want to talk about avoiding overhead when designing APIs. Now, what kind of overhead? I want to I want to talk about stopping. I want to talk about bloated, overly flexible APIs, and how not to build those. You know. Bloated, examples of bloated, overly flexible APIs might be APIs that have queries that nobody asked for, endpoints that nobody's using, you know, generally unused functionality, like extra fields, extra relationships, and all of these things that you have to maintain, although nobody asked for. Now, what kind of APIs am I going to be talking about? I'm going to be talking about HTTP-based APIs mostly, so like REST APIs, JSON APIs, GraphQL, etc. But in general, this talk is going to be API technology agnostic. It's going to be applicable for all kinds of APIs. And through this talk, we're going to be building a blogging platform, something similar to Medium or Dev2. Now, the blogging platform uh, will have a couple of entities and relationships. So it'll have authors that can release posts, and it's going to have posts that can have comments. So it's going to be fairly simple. Now, <clears throat> I will talk about two principles for building APIs. The first one being designing the minimal API surface or how not to overexpose data on your APIs. And then designing from strict to loose or how to avoid building extra flexibility that nobody asked for. Okay, so for the first principle, design the minimal API surface. Generally, I see a pattern where developers try to be speculative about what's going to be needed in the future. So they all often overbuild their APIs. Now, I'm going to talk about a bloated API surface, and I'm going to break it into three patterns of a bloated surface that I usually see. The first one being redundant fields, second one redundant relationships, and third one redundant input fields. Okay, so don't expose redundant fields. Now, let's imagine we're building this blogging platform, and a product manager tells us we need to show the author of the blog post. Pretty reasonable. And now we have an author's table. It's got an ID. It's got a first name, last name, an email, and an avatar URL. Now, what we see, and this is literally just a screenshot from Medium, we can see that on, on our screen, there's an avatar. There's the first name. There's the last name. There is no email. Now, a friendly API developer that might be building this platform might say, you know, let's expose the email. Somebody might find it useful in the future. You know, why wouldn't we expose the email field right away? We're going to spend more time exposing it if we need it afterwards, right? So we're technically saving time for the business. So the friendly API developer goes into some kind of a markup for, you know, for building APIs. It doesn't matter what this is. Looks similar to, you know, a GraphQL. Or it can be whatever. And besides the ID, the first name, last name, and avatar, the friendly API developer adds the email field as well. Now, imagine a scenario six months later, for privacy reasons, we need to stop exposing the email. I'm not making this up. 
there's GDPR in Europe, there's California privacy laws, uh, there's privacy laws all over the world, uh, which state that you shouldn't expose data uh, that's you know PII unless it's really needed. In this case, it's not needed. So what do we need to do now? Now we gotta go through a whole deprecation cycle. We need to mark the field as deprecated if you know your API schema descriptors allow that. Or if it's a version of the API, we potentially need to you know release a new API version. Now then we need to go to extreme amounts of communication. We need to send out emails, reach out to clients. You know, if it's a platform, it's really hard. You give you gotta give folks a few months of lead time. If it's a private API, maybe it's a little bit easier, but nonetheless, it's like you know, smaller amount of clients, but it's a lot of communication still. And then you're potentially breaking clients. And it really depends on what kind of API you have. Uh, if you have something that ha that doesn't have any kind of like sparse field sets or anything like that, so basically whenever somebody reaches for a resource or an entity or a type, whatever you want to call it, uh, and always receives all the fields back, so once they fetch an author, they will always get all the fields, you technically don't have any idea whether you're breaking clients or not. You, you know, you might send out an email and multiple announcements that you're removing this field, but you won't be able to know whether it's actually going to break some clients. And then if you have sparse field sets, you know, like JSON API specification has, or, you know, GraphQL that lets you kind of pick and choose which uh, attributes of a type you want to take, you know, you might be in some luck, but you better have good metrics and observability around these things. And then in general, it's extreme amounts of redundant cycles. It's multiple deploys. Uh, you know, you got to deploy it to your testing or staging server, test it out, then deploy it to prod. It's not just easy as removing a few lines of code. The technical aspect of, you know, opening up that pull request and sending it out is, is the easiest. Like actually communicating uh, that you're going to make this change is the big headache. Okay, now on to the next one. Don't expose redundant relationships. This one's pretty similar. So let's imagine we have a requirement. Indicate whether a post was reviewed. So let's let's imagine we're you know creating this new feature on our blogging platform that where we can have some kind of a peer review system on our blogs or blog posts. And so whenever somebody releases a post, we can have somebody review it, like a group of reviewers or something like that, and then potentially like have a green check mark next to the post type. Now, let's imagine we have, this is what our post looks like. It's got a title and a body, both are strings. And then we decide, you know, let's add a reviewed field, which is a Boolean, uh, which is, you know, pretty much what we need. Any kind of UI uh, developer or mobile developer might be able just, you know, based on this field, be able to determine whether to put like a little green check mark or not. Now, the friendly API developer, you might say, let's expose the reviewer for future use case. So not only where the field was reviewed, but who the person that reviewed was as well. So the friendly API developer might do something like this. Well, now, what, what did we do with this? Development costs are growing. So we potentially need to do some kind of batch or eager loading. We need to test out whether the reviewer is loading uh, appropriately and then we're potentially having performance impacts. Performance impacts, again, really depending on what kind of API you're building. If you have APIs where you can pick and choose which fields, it might be okay. If every time we're loading a post, we're also loading a reviewer, that's really, really bad because we're, we're adding negative performance impacts. We're adding latency to those calls. And then what happens if we decide in the future to actually say, you know, let's not only have a single reviewer, let's actually have a team of reviewers or, you know, multiple reviewers. And now, and let's expose them actually. So now all of a sudden from not having to need this field, we need to actually change it. And now we need to do a breaking change potentially and go through a deprecation cycle. Again, a lot of communication, emails, Potentially Slack messages really depends on what kind of API you have. And then again, breaking clients. 
But one thing we're not utilizing here is delaying decisions. Because adding later when we have more knowledge is better. So if we decided to lay the delay the decision on when we're going to, you know, expose these reviewers, we might do it a different different way. Like six months down the road, we might not name that resource reviewer. We might name that resource user or something like that. And it's not going to be a lot more work, but we're going to have a nicer API surface. Because when you think of it, whenever you add things later in the system, it's you're going to have more knowledge about that system and you're going to make a better decision as long as you're you know you know not postponing future uh, releases in general it's easier to add in the future than to remove i've been through this many times where i was removing stuff that nobody asked for and i guarantee it's way easier to add it in the future than it is than it is to remove you know sometimes additions to the api can be done within an hour while removals take a lot of time Okay, so that's about exposing fields on queryable resources. Let's talk about input fields. Don't expose redundant input fields. Now, what kind of input fields am I talking about? I'm talking about the payload your API accepts when mutating or changing data. In REST APIs, that would be the data your API gets whenever a client initiates a post or a put request. Let's look at an example. Readers, we have a requirement again. Readers need to be able to create and update comments. Pretty reasonable for a blogging platform, right? Okay, so let's imagine we have an input that accepts a post ID and a body. Pretty okay. And now the friendly API developer might say, let's have parity between inputs. So now we might have an update comment input that has an ID, so you know how to reference that actual comment which was created, and then a body and the post ID just because the create comment had. Well, all that you needed was an ID and a body. Now, why would you add a post ID here? The blogging platform doesn't support like common transitions from one post to another. Could you imagine? What would you gain with having that post ID there? Like what happens if somebody sends the same post ID, the correct one? Are you just, you know, you're gonna let it pass. Okay, what if the client sends the wrong one? Are you going to have additional validations just to prevent something like this? Although you actually never needed it. I would say avoid anemic data modeling. You know, sure the comment does have a post ID, sure the create comment uh, input does have a post ID, but it doesn't mean we are able to update it. No, these do not have to match. You're supposed to build your apps according to your business needs and that business logic should be on the server, not on the client. Uh, Mark from GitHub actually has an excellent blog post that's called GraphQL Mutation Design Anemic Mutations and he dives deeper into these. Okay, and the la lastly about it, I would say is ambiguity deteriorates developer experience. Your you know, clients that are building against your API might get confused. Like what happens if I send the same value? What happens if I send a different value? And then lastly, you ain't gonna need it. Just don't add it. If for whatever reason, your blogging platform weirdly starts supporting common transitions from one blog post to another, which I really cannot imagine in this scenario, you can just add it later. Okay, and now for the second principle, strict to loose. I wanna talk about this principle again, broken up in two points. First one being avoiding extra flexibility and the second one breaks first. So let's start with the first one. Avoid extra flexibility. So when you're building APIs, what you wanna do is be ready for extra flexibility in the future, but not extremely flexible now. You wanna scope out what is needed for your clients. So let's imagine we have a requirement. The users need to be able to see comments on a post. So let's imagine we have some kind of a query or you know uh, an endpoint that's called comments and it accepts a post ID and it's required. Now the friendly API developer might say, our clients might wanna fetch all comments in the future. Let's you know just enable them not to send that post ID. So the friendly API developer might make the post ID actually optional. Now, what did we get with this? Now, we have unneeded application logic. We need to handle both cases when there is a post ID and when there is not. Uh, more code in general means more maintenance. Anytime you change the commenting logic, you need to reflect that in both scenarios. And what if you have caching? You have two strategies for both of these scenarios or for each, for each scenario. 
And then more code in general, I mean, it's more tests. You got to test both cases. I would say on inputs, it's easy to go from required to optional, not the other way around. So strict to loose or required to optional gives you more control. It gives the client less flexibility, but it's not the flexibility that they've ever asked for. But it gives you more flexibility in terms of changing. While loose to strict or optional to required is a breaking change. And then breaks first. This is the second part of the second principle I want to talk about, and it's about defensive programming, ensuring that your API is not going to get abused. So let's go with the same example, ability to fetch comments for a post. Now, the friendly API developer might say, let's just give them an array of comments. We don't need pagination. Or a better version of this might be, let's just give them an array of comments. We don't need pagination yet. Now, the friendly API developer might build uh, the API like this that gives just back an array of comments and might say, you know, we won't have more than five comments per post. And six months later, there's posts with hundreds of comments. Now the developer might say, let's add pagination. Now, great. You know, that might be potentially a breaking change or introducing a new query or a new endpoint that the developer needs to maintain, which is not ideal. Now the developer might say, work is done. Let's go home. That's it. Well, you know, not so sh not so quickly. What if our clients actually started initiating uh, queries that say, you know, just give me the first 1,000 comments. You know, the client was too lazy to actually do paginated requests. And what happened? The friendly API developer didn't add limits to pagination. You now, add pagin adding pagination limits from the beginning is what makes more sense. You might may you know have an error message that says you know requesting a thousand records exceeds the limit of a hundred records that we're able to give you it's super hard to add retroactively but super easy to adjust in the future you might add you know a lower limit at the beginning and then increase it while the other way around is a breaking change now how to avoid all of these overheads that i'm talking that i talked about today i would say first adopt schema first design you know, figure out what, you, what is your domain and for whom you're building your API. Don't play guessing games. Don't couple your API to specific implementations. You know, maybe today you have a relational database that is backing some of this data, but tomorrow it might be some API that won't have the same fields and you might bring yourself more trouble than anything. And then talk to your clients. Involve them early in the process. Figure out what their needs are. Don't try to be speculative. And be responsive to your clients' requests. As you're building out a minimal schema that is not overloaded, you have to be responsive to future requests. Now, there's always exceptions. Like a couple of them might be that you're building some kind of a platform API and you're trying to get ahead of competitors and trying to drive user adoption. But even then, I would question how much this kind of speculation is worth it. And then a second example, which I think is potentially more valid, but it's really rare, is constraints due to release cycles. I have a coworker that worked on APIs that were deployed on premises for their clients. They would release these once every six months, and they would have to do thousands of deployments every time they released. If they missed the field that a client might need, they would have to repeat the same redeployments, which would be really costly. This is probably not the scenario that you have. OK, so in conclusion, uh, redundant work slows down progress on important features. You might be able to spend your time more wisely by improving you know, API documentation, improving slow queries, etc. Exposing too much data can be highly unproductive. You know, there's a saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Even though we might think we're doing something good for our API clients and being a good partner, moves like this are not that case. Thank you all. Uh, I'm glad you could all join here. This is my Twitter, uh, and I'm going to take more questions uh, now, and you can reach out to me on Twitter later. Thank you so much, Amir. That was that was really great. Um, you know, I really appreciate all of the details that you know you went into talking about the uh, different approaches. And so the first question we have, and I think you touched a little bit on this towards the end, but are there ever any instances where you might find, you know, overly bloated, flexible APIs to be useful. And, you know, if, if so, you know, can you please talk a little bit about when that would be beneficial? Yeah, yeah, sure thing. So as you said, I've touched on it at the end. 
the only two, and I've talked with multiple people on this, the only two instances that I saw that would potentially be useful uh, would be if you're you know, having a platform API and trying to kind of catch up against competition if you're in, in that kind of a business. Uh, but as said, even then, I would not see it as, as really being super valuable. What I would say being more valuable is just listening to what your clients are asking. Once your clients start giving you uh, input on what kind of APIs they'd want to have, listen to them, work with them, and be prompt, be responsive. Uh, I work with multiple platform APIs in Netflix, uh, and, you know, with with platform teams. And when we ask for uh, for things to be added on their APIs, they're pretty responsive, especially if it's you know a reasonable uh, ask and it can be added you know within a day. So, and it doesn't bloat up their surface and it doesn't add more work to them initially and they don't have to be speculative. Thank you for that. The second question is, you know, can you speak a little more to additional API solutions that are ideal for focusing on business and differentiation? Business differentiation and I don't know. Well, I would say like a big change for me with, uh, was when I, Kind of started doing more GraphQL APIs uh, or APIs with GraphQL, uh, which has really nice schema descriptors, uh, which you know you can, you know, you have automatic deprecation there. You can mark specific fields as deprecated. You can really nicely annotate it. Uh, so that was definitely a big differentiator for us, and it kind of pushes you away from this anemic modeling, uh, which is you know which gives you more options like you know specifying directly like which inputs get which fields and you're not trying to basically anemically build your apis uh i think there's a lot of solutions that give you flexibility flexibilities like that graphql is definitely not the silver bullet there but i would say it kind of it kind of naturally fits uh in there great one more question for you and so what if, you know, I think that we tend to work sometimes with clients who communicate a lot. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have clients who don't tend to be as great with collaboration and communication. And so in an instance where you have a client who isn't great with communication, what are some suggestions or recommendations you have for getting feedback about your API and, you know, in a timely manner? Yeah, sure thing. Well, I would say when, when there's clients that are not super communicative, uh, I would try to dig a lot more into into what their use cases are, trying to trying to understand what it is that they want to get from our APIs, uh, and you know, generally not not just try to uh, ask them what kind of APIs they want, but what are their underlying use cases, and try to try to kind of build it from there. I think that that always helps. Wonderful. And so once more, thank you so much for your time today. This has been really wonderful, really insightful. And, you know, I, I would like to give you a few seconds to talk again about, you know, how people can access you. I know there are a couple of more questions in the chat. And so, you know, what, what's the best way for people to reach out to you? Yeah, I'll, I'll join Hoppin uh, now. And, um, and folks can reach me uh, on Twitter as well. It's at Damir Svartan. Uh, pretty simple. Yeah. Thank you, Damir. Have a great yeah. rest of your day. Enjoy the conference. Thank you. Have a good day.